introduce to you God's messenger for us this afternoon. Our messenger needs no introduction to some of us. Probably some of us, we have known him for quite a while now. He has been in the ministry for almost 30 years. Believe me, he's not that old. <laughs> and I have known him personally for the last 20 years. And he is currently the senior pastor of the Filipino Christian Church in Los Angeles, California. Uh, he has a lovely wife. She's not here today. Her name is Laura Lee. And he has with him his uh, two lovely daughters, Reggae and T Tiffany. Tiffany, I'm sorry. And they will uh, render also a, a song for us uh, today. And uh, it, is, it is my greatest joy and privilege to I guess welcome our messenger for this afternoon. Church, open your hearts and your minds for God's message through his messenger, Pastor Einstein Cavalbea. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, Pastor Arnel, for the wonderful introduction. If you're not ready, uh, may I invite everybody to stand up in honor of God's Word and read with me. You have your Bibles with you. Open your applications. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 11. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you receive, in which you stand. And by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believe in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. That he was buried and he was raised from the third day, on the third day, in accordance with the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time. Most of them are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether that I was I, it was I or they, so we preach and so you believe. Let's bow our heads and pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this wonderful opportunity to turn to your word. We are not interested, Lord, to any man's wisdom. We invite you, Lord, by the Holy Spirit to be with us as we seek your word. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 We may not be seated. Last week we celebrated Easter. Uh, churches worldwide commemorated the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I'm sure you had a wonderful Easter as well in the church that I'm currently serving right now. We had a wonderful celebration. I don't know about the eggs, but kids are happy with them, so that's fine with me. <laughs> but why do we celebrate Easter? Why do we as Christians believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead? And when we say that we believe in Christ's resurre res resurrection, we mean real resurrection, and not as a zombie. Like those scary creatures we see on horror movies, and that are really dead, but they move. In those fiction movies, they depict resurrected people as living dead who are hungry of human flesh or blood or human brains in some movies. And not only that we believe in his resurrection, we also believe that when he rose from the grave, he came back to his friends, so alive and well. He ate with them, talked with them, walked with them for 40 more days before he was lifted up on high. After that, his friends did not see him anymore. He told them that he's coming back. 
the same way that he left to bring together to himself all who believe in him. And we believe that this event happened 2,000 years ago. And this story was told from generation to generation. And here we are, 2,000 years later, still talking about the same event. And it still hasn't come back. And we Christians, we still celebrate, waiting for his return. But many do not believe, even some Christians are now doubting, is this story real or not? Is this story true or false? Did Christ really rise from the dead? Is Christ's resurrection a proof or a spoof? Today, I'd like to share with you why we as Christians believe in the resurrected Christ. I'd like to share with you at least three points, or three R's, if you will. Thank you so much, Pastor Moses, for putting those inserts so you could put uh, or take notes, take down notes. Three R's about the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Number one, let's talk about records. Records. All the gospel books, namely Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, recorded this event, Christ's resurrection. We don't have, have any time to go through all the gospel records at this moment, but we can use the verses we read earlier. Going back to our text, verses 5 to 8. Paul strengthens the records of the gospel writers. I believe that the records of Christ's resurrection were very important to those people who wrote them because they were persecuted and died because of these records. Some of them were stoned to death, protecting these records. Many of them were thrown into den of lions for the entertainment of their persecutors who ridiculed them. Others were tortured, suffered mocking and flogging, and even in chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, sewn into and killed by sword. And then the next generation who guard, kept and protected these records with their lives were persecuted and died just the same. So why would we suffer? Why would they suffer for a myth? Is it if it's a myth? Or why would they give their lives for a gossip if the resurrected Christ was just a gossip? Many people say that uh, the incident did not really happen and that the said witnesses were just hallucinating or making these things up. Some others say that there are differences in the gospel narratives so that the event couldn't be true. Well, I say that the fact that the differences were there between this record, it means that Christ's resurrection was not a made-up story because if you will make up a made-up made story, you want to make sure that it's an it's a attack-proof document or a shock-proof document, meaning you don't want anybody to, to say something against it. If you want to make a story just like this. And the difference we see is because of the fact that the writers are, were coming from their own perspective, from their unique context. But that doesn't mean that the event did not happen. The resurrection, the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ indeed happened. The fact that the records survived 2,000 years and are still intact in spite of the attacks they get from the religious organization, agnostics, and atheists, and even the so called Christians around the world. And because of its legendary history, how they, these gospel records made it into the Holy Scriptures, that it is something that men and women, even nowadays, need to seriously look deeper into. And the gospel record shows that it was not only the disciples who witnessed Christ's resurrection. After he rose from the grave, our text shows that Christ showed himself to at least 500 people at one time. So, how can you make up a story with 500 witnesses? Thus, the resurrection of Christ is true and the Bible is the best reliable source about it. Furthermore, in those days, sorry to tell you, women, they don't put women as witnesses, especially when you put them in a stand, in a trial. Much less if you put up, if you make up story. But contrary to that, the narrative's first witnesses were women. So why did the writers put, put them there? That is 
because the event was not just fabricated by some tax man and fishermen from Galilee. This event happened indeed. And so Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John carefully penned the event that they saw and heard about it from the first-hand witnesses. Therefore, it is wise to conclude that Christ's resurrection is true and real, holding on to the gospel records as we now have. Number two, relevance. Relevance. Through history books, anyone can prove one or two events that happened in the past. But if they don't have relevance to me, why would I care? I know that World War I and World War II happened. Many times my late father talked about his experience during the war. But why would I care? How is it related to me? Why is it important to me? Does it matter? I know my family, my wife, my children matters to me. I know my, I, I care for my wife, my care for, cares for me. Why? Because we live, practically live every day. We see each other. But why would I care for a story that happened 2,000 years ago? I have not been there. Even if, if, even if it's true, why would, it, why would it matter to me? And this resurrected carpenter, the Bible says that he died from, that he died and, and rose from the grave for me. Why? What was his business with me? And even if I know the answer, why would I care? From the scriptures that we read earlier in our text, verses 3 and 4. Paul, the writer, is telling his readers about the relevance of Christ's resurrection. For I deliver to you of the first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scripture. That he was buried, that he was raised in the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Therefore, Christ's resurrection matters to me because of his death. He needed to die in order for him to be resurrected. And that matters to me. Why? That is because I was scared to die. It was only when I became a Christian and accepted the Lord Jesus Christ that I understood the meaning of life and death. I don't know about you, but when I was small, small I had a lot of fears. Um, I had a fear of heights. Isn't it obvious? Heights. I had a fear of losing my hair. I guess I overcame that already. I had a fear of speaking to a lot of people, such as this. I fear my wife. <laughs> yeah, that is because I don't wanna, I'm afraid of losing her, you see? <laughs> but kidding aside, kidding aside, most of all, I'm sure you'll agree with me that one of man's greatest fear is death. Christ's resurrection is relevant because of the reality of death in this life. When I was young, I first felt this fear of death when my grandmother died. It was the first time I asked, when is my turn? Then as I grew older, I see new babies are born, and it reminds me that when a baby is born and starts breathing, I know that there will come a day that that breathing will stop. Death is one of the scariest ultimate thing in this world. Even the most brainy people in this world then and now cannot solve the problem of death. Let's talk about death for a moment. I know one doctor from Universal Pictures who tried to solve the problem of death through his studies of chemical processes. He tried to alter the decay of, of living being. His name is Dr. Victor Frankenstein. But even in this movie, it's just a movie, okay? I don't think he was successful. Why? Because what he made was not, was a monster, not really a human being. Other than him, I don't know of any person who has created life and or successfully escaped death. They said nobody can ever escape the prison island of Alcatraz. Since 1936, many tried and attempted to escape, but no one was successfully succeeded until Frank Morris and the Anglin brothers made the most intricate escape in June of 1960. So even the most guarded, shielded, or protected prison couldn't warranty escape, right? 
They said that Harry Houdini was the greatest when it comes to escapees. He was able to escape successfully with handcuffs, chains, locks, and even from prison cells. Straight jackets underwater inside a sealed milk can. But there's this one box that he couldn't escape from since 1926 until now. He's still there in that box, six feet underground, dead. And we all know that the moment you stop growing, you start dying. So scientists these days are producing these wellness products we see online or grocery stores or pharmacies. And these companies are flourishing in this kind of industry because of these anti-wrinkle or anti-aging products. People don't want to get old. And people are desperately buying these products. But could they really prevent men and women from getting older or eventually dying? But who could ever escape death and never die again? How could men and women really prevent, prevent death? People think that the problem is the food we eat. Others think that the problem is the air we breathe. But they don't know, they don't have any clue of the real issue in this life. The real problem is sin. When sin entered into this world, death came along with it. And until one recognizes the authority of God, Christ's death and resurrection, he or she can never solve the problem of death. Jesus said, Matthew, oh no, John, chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. It says here, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he dies, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And then Jesus asked his listeners, do you believe that? What that means is the reality of physical death will be experienced by all. But to those who believe in Jesus, for them, death will be like falling asleep, waiting for that great day that He will wake them up again, just as God rose Jesus Christ, the only one who made it through death and resurrection. So is Christ's resurrection relevant? Of course it is. It gives us hope. It gives us purpose to our lives. It gives us direction as to where we are and where we're going. Take away Christ's resurrection, then our lives will be like, what? Get up in the morning, go to work, earn money, eat, go home, sleep, get up in the morning, go to work, earn a living, buy food, eat, go home, sleep, get up in the morning. It will be like a, a such a boring cycle of life without direction, without purpose. That's why the scripture uplifts us in verses 14 and 19, same chapter of our text. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished, if in Christ we have hope in in this life only, we are of all people most obedient. But that's not the case we have here in Christ. Christ's resurrection is true and real. And it gives more meaning than anything in this life. That is because our hope in Christ is not of this life. And Christ's resurrection connects us to that life. Number three, response. Number three, response. The story of Christ's resurrection wouldn't make any sense if there were no records that support that claim. And the records and testimony of the gospel wouldn't make any sense if they don't have relevance in our lives, right? But the records and relevance would not benefit us if we don't respond to the story. It says in, it says in our text, verses 1 and 2, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you receive in which you stand and by which you are being saved if you hold fast to the word I preach to you. The gospel story, story comes with an invitation and the invitation has RSVP at the bottom. It has an initials, which means, what's the meaning of RSVP anyway? 
Yeah, I think it's a French. I don't know what that, but I know the meaning of that. It means please respond. You know why I know this meaning? Because it happened to me. It happened to me once. Uh, I received an invitation, and sure enough, it has an RSVP at the bottom. I, uh, I forgot to respond. I went to the party. I dressed up. And then the coordinator was right there, and he said, You did not respond. I thought you were not coming. That was embarrassing, right? I thought I was going to kick out. But if the coordinator kicked me out, it was only right, right? Because I did not respond. Lucky enough, I was not kicked out. He said, oh, somebody uh, did not come, so you can come in. You. Same by the way. Christ's records and relevance would not give us any good if we don't believe and respond to it. Just like in my own experience, an example, I can believe all I want that I, I am invited. I can wear the nicest suit. I can rent a limo to drive me and drop me off to that party. But if I fail to respond, everything I've done and all the preparation benefit me nothing. That is the same way with Christ's resurrection. I can believe all I want about Christ's resurrection. I can go to all churches and proclaim it. Jesus rose from the dead. I can donate so much and volunteer my whole life for the ministry, but unless I respond to his invitation, Christ's resurrection will forever be a useless, irrelevant story to me. This is the same thing when you sign a contract. Almost in any facet of life, this is practical. If you don't respond, it's useless. Like if I say, I believe I can sit there, I believe I can sing. I believe I can play guitar. But if you don't put into action, it's nonsense. In a contract, when you sign a contract, that's your response. Your signature is your response. No signature means no response, no confirmation, no commitment. That's why the Apostle Paul says in our text, brothers of the gospel I preach to you, which you receive in which you stand and by which you are being saved if you hold fast you see there are things that we need to do if you hold fast you are being saved receive means believe on the gospel which is that Christ died buried rose from the grave receiving means you commit yourself to him by repenting from all your sins not to go back to the old life confessing to Jesus alone all your sins and be baptized in His name to seal the commitment to Him. That's your, that's, that's your signature. You say, okay, Lord, from this day forward, I will commit myself to you. Go there and be baptized. Stand on the gospel means living by its guidelines, defending it and sharing it to our friends and relatives. That's the meaning of standing on the gospel. Holding fast onto the gospel means hold on to it tight, not allowing the, any slight possibility of slipping it away. You don't want anybody to, to grab it away from you. Holding tight. Do you see how important that we should respond to Christ's RSVP? Once we heard the gospel, we should receive it, stand by it, and hold fast to it. Because by it, the, the Bible says we are being saved. Saved from what? Saved from being kicked out from the great party in heaven. And when we when do we must respond? The Bible says, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. Behold, when? Now. now is the accepted time. Not tomorrow, not next week, not next year. Now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. For those of you who have not responded to Christ's invitation, I'd like to challenge you right now, brothers and sisters. Review the gospel records of Christ's resurrection. Realize its relevance and respond to his invitation by receiving him right now into your hearts as your Lord and Savior. And the gift of eternal life is yours, secured in God's hand. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, this will be my last 
cross-reference to you. Jesus said in Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, I'd like to remind you about the salvation you now enjoy, standing and holding fast to the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us not grow weak, but strengthen one another by these truths. May, may I invite everybody to stand up as we sing in the teaching song.